We have discussed previously that we need metrics to evaluate a mechanism after we design it. This is because, as you have seen, during the design process, we make choices. So we need to understand the effect of these choices. In this lecture, we will delve more into the question, how do we evaluate a mechanism? The discussion here will not be comprehensive, but it will give you a basic idea about how to go about evaluating a design mechanism methodically. The first question of interest that you should ask is, do the link lengths satisfy packaging constraints if there are any? The link lengths of the mechanism should satisfy any context-specific or application-specific packaging constraints that may be there. So you need to make sure that the link lengths are reasonable. The second question of interest is, does the mechanism satisfy Grashof criteria? Being Grashof or non-Grashof by itself is not good or bad. In some cases, being Grashof is required. For example, when you know that you want to design a crank rocker mechanism, or when you know that you will drive the mechanism with a continuous rotational input or a crank. In such cases, having a non-Grashof mechanism simply doesn't work. However, in many cases, whether the mechanism is crank rocker or double crank or double rocker or triple rocker helps in answering other questions, as we will see below. One such question of interest is, does the mechanism have good transmission angle? So let us recall what is transmission angle. So this is a four bar mechanism with the input angle theta two. The transmission angle is the minimum acute angle mu between the coupler and the output link. So as the angle theta two varies or as the link moves, the angle between the coupler and the output link changes. And the minimum of those angles is the transmission angle mu. Let's remind ourselves why the transmission angle is important. F is the force that acts along the coupler. So the force normal to the output link is F sine mu. And if L4 is the length of this link, then the magnitude of the moment acting on the link 4 is F sine mu times L4. Now, as you can see from here, as the transmission angle mu tends to zero, the moment that is acting on this output link, which moves this output link, tends to zero. And if this moment becomes small, what happens is that the mechanism gets locked due to friction. So one question of interest here becomes, what is the appropriate value of the transmission angle? This is very context specific. If you do not have too much idea, about the frictional characteristics or the application environment, then a safe assumption is to keep the transmission angle above 40 degrees. However, this is a rule of thumb. There are many applications where you can get away with even lower transmission angles. For example, we can live with small transmission angles if we have some other rotational energy storage device, such as a flywheel, that can help drive the mechanism through the stationary configuration. Furthermore, in some applications, a transmission angle of zero may be desirable. We will see this later in this module. Note that if we know that our mechanism will be double rocker or triple rocker, then the transmission angle is zero. Another question of interest is, can the mechanism move continuously between the given poses? So you have seen in design that we have three given poses. Let's call them one, two, three. And then we design the mechanism based on these three poses. The methods that we use just assumes that the mechanism is at these three positions. There is no information that it will continuously move between these three positions from one to two and two to three. And if you design a mechanism based on the methods that you have described, you will see that many times that mechanism doesn't really work. The types of defects that can happen are called order defect, circuit defect, 
or branch defect. Now order defect means that the order in which you visit the poses, this one, two, three, that can change. Now that will happen only if you have more than three poses. If you have three poses, order defect never happens. So in this lecture, we will not discuss order defect anymore. What we'll concentrate on is circuit defect and branch defect. So what is a circuit? A circuit is the set of all possible configurations of the links that can be realized without disconnecting any of the joints. So let us take an example to understand this better. Let us say that the picture here shows a crank rocker mechanism with O2A as the crank. When we did the position kinematics, we saw that this mechanism for any given position theta2 of the input link can have two different positions of the coupler and the output link. They are shown as this open and crossed configurations. Now you should see immediately that physically both of these configurations cannot exist simultaneously. The mechanism cannot be simultaneously in the open and the crossed configuration. If I give you any design problem where I have to go through both B and B prime, that is not possible. Unless and until you open this hinge at B here and then you reconnect it at B prime. So B and B prime are on two different circuits. This is a little bit of an extreme example, but in general, this idea is true. If the given poses are on two different circuits of this mechanism, then you cannot really reach all those three configurations with continuous motion. A branch, on the other hand, is a continuous series of positions of the mechanism on a circuit between two stationary configurations. A stationary configuration is a configuration where the coupler and the output link are collinear. The stationary configuration divides a circuit into a series of branches. So with this definition of circuit and branch, we are now ready to define circuit and branch defect. For a designed mechanism, if the desired configurations do not lie on the same circuit, that is, the mechanism cannot move from one configuration to another continuously without disassembling and reassembling, the resulting mechanism is unusable and the defect is called the circuit defect. On the other hand, for a designed mechanism, if the mechanism has to move through a toggle configuration or stationary position to move between any two desired configurations, the resulting mechanism may become unusable and that depends on dynamic effects. Such a defect is called a branch defect. So during a branch defect, your transmission angle may become zero. Now for four bar mechanisms, people have characterized all the possible circuits and branches that can happen. For a triple rocker mechanism, there can be one circuit and two branches. For crank rocker or double crank mechanism, there can be two circuits and one branch per circuit. For a double rocker or rocker crank mechanism, there can be two circuits and two branches per circuit. So now given this information, how do we develop a procedure to understand whether a given mechanism has circuit or branch defect? To answer that question, we have to first understand the extreme positions of a mechanism. We have already seen how to compute the extreme positions of a crank rocker mechanism. We will now see how to compute the extreme positions of double rocker and triple rocker mechanism. Let us consider the four bar mechanism O2, A, B and O4. So B1 and B2 are the extreme positions of the moving pivot B and A1 and A2 are the extreme positions of the moving pivot A. As you can see from the figure, when the moving pivot B is at B1, the moving pivot A is at A1 bar, which is this point here. When the moving pivot B is at B2, the moving pivot A is at A2 bar, 
which is this point here. So the extreme angular position of the input link and the follower links may not coincide. When the follower link is O4B1, my input link is at O2A1 bar. When the follower link is at O4B2, my input link is at O2A2 bar. Whereas the extreme positions of my input link are O2A1 and O2A2. An analogous thing can be observed that when my input link is at its extreme positions, then my output link does not need to be at as its extreme positions. So given this fact, how do you compute the extreme positions of the output link O4B as well as the input link O2A? Let's first consider the output link O4B. Let the length of the fixed link be L1, this link be L2, coupler be L3, and output link be L4. So now, to compute the extreme positions of the link O4B, let's first look at the triangle O2, B1, O4. I have the link length O2, O4 as L1. The length O2, B1 is L2 plus L3, which is O2, A1 bar plus A1 bar, B1. And the length O4, B1 is L4. So I can use the law of cosines to obtain this angle beta 1. Similarly, look at the triangle O2, B2, O4, which is this triangle here. O2, B2 is L2 minus L3. O2, O4 is L1 and O4, B2 is L4. So from this triangle, I can compute this angle beta 2. Beta 1 and beta 2 gives me the range of motion of the output link. In an analogous fashion, using the law of cosines, I can use the triangles O2, A1, O4 and triangle O2, A2, O4 to compute the range of motion of the input link O2A. So in essence, you can compute the extreme positions of both the input link and the output link using law of cosines. We can use a similar procedure to compute the extreme positions of a triple rocker mechanism. Again, let my mechanism be O2, A, B, O4 and B1 and B2 with the extreme positions of the moving pivot B. Let A1 and A2 be the extreme positions of the moving pivot A. Let my ground link be L1, the input link be L2, coupler be L3, and the output link be L4. Here again, I can see that my output link is at the position O4B1. My input link is at the position O2 A1 bar and A1 bar is not the extreme position of the moving pivot A. The extreme position is A1. So the extreme angular positions of the input and the follower link or the output link may not coincide. To compute the extreme positions of the link O4B, we have to first look at the triangle O2 B1 O4. The length O2 B1 is L2 plus L3. The length O4 B1 is L4 and the length O2 O4 is L1. So again, I can use the law of cosines and compute this angle beta 1. Similarly, from the triangle O2 B2 O4, I can compute this angle beta 2. So my range of motion of the output link O4B is beta 1 plus beta 2. In an analogous fashion, I can use the triangles O2, A1, O4 and the triangles O2, 
a2 o4 and use law of cosines to compute the extreme positions of the link o2a so using geometry and law of cosines you can compute the extreme positions for both the double rocker and triple rocker mechanism and this will come in handy when you want to check whether your mechanism has circuit or branch defect that can affect your operation in general checking for circuits and branch defects of mechanisms is quite complicated what we are discussing here is a simplistic procedure that works only for four bar mechanisms so let's first see how we check for circuit defects so given the design mechanism for the given design requirements the first step that you need to do is determine the type of the mechanism whether it is class shaft or non class shaft if the mechanism is non class shaft and that is acceptable you immediately know that it doesn't have any circuit defect because a non class shaft mechanism has a single circuit however it may have branch defect on the other hand if your mechanism is class shaft and in particular if it is of type crank rocker or double rocker you have to first find the extreme positions of the mechanism if all your desired positions are not within these extreme positions then there is a circuit defect now for a double crank mechanism you have to simulate the mechanism and visually check whether you are going through all the given poses to check for branch defects you have to first find the stationary configurations for the design mechanism recall that stationary configurations mean that the output link and the coupler will be collinear there are two situations that can happen the link ab may fold over the link o4b or the link ab and o4b may be along a straight line in both cases by looking at the triangle o2a o4 we can compute this angle theta 21 and this angle theta 22 where the stationary configurations occur if any of these angles are between the two desired configurations then there is a branch defect now recall that if you have a double crank or a crank rocker mechanism then there is only one branch per circuit so you can never have branch defect for those two mechanisms for the other mechanisms you have to use the procedure to check for branch defects now let us see an example where being at a stationary configuration is useful and desirable so the mechanism shown in this picture is that for opening or closing a truck tailgate the truck body here is the link 1 the tailgate is the link 2 this is the link 3 and this is the link 4 now when the tailgate is open the link 3 and link 4 are collinear so in this configuration you can apply a large amount of load on the tailgate the reaction at this spin will be along this direction so there will be no moment about this pivot here so theoretically this tailgate can support an arbitrary amount of load of course practically it will be limited by the mechanical strength of the components so in essence a large amount of load can be supported by the truck tailgate in this configuration to get the uh, tailgate into a folded configuration we have to first apply a force here to release this toggle or to move away from this toggle configuration and then applying a small force here will make sure that we can get into the folded position now this kind of mechanisms where we actually want to support a large load at a certain configuration is used in many other different places one such example is a folding chair 